Hi everybody and welcome to this seven part video series on how to go from sim racing to real racing. A few years ago I became a licensed racing driver and spent two years racing at many of the circuits around the UK. In this video series I'll hopefully share my story and try to offer advice for anybody else that would like to do this themselves. So in part one I'm going to give a bit of an introduction. I'm going to talk about my story and why I wanted to race. You may be watching this thinking, hang on, I want to know how to go racing. Why are you just telling me your life story? Uh, the main reason I'm just telling a bit of a story about why I wanted the race is just so that for anybody out there that is considering it, then you ultimately know where my head was at and what I'd come from before I actually decided to go racing. So as I touched upon in the intro, uh, I raced for about two years. I think it was something like eight or ten races in total all around the UK. Um, the series that I competed in, I'll go into more detail later on. It was an endurance series with two drivers. Um, and yeah, uh, we basically shared the car uh, and went through the whole journey together. In future videos, I'll look at um, how you can find a series, how you can find or build a race car, and ultimately everything you need to go racing. And then in some of the other videos, we'll look at a couple of the races that I did um, and I'll critique it. Uh, just like I do with my normal videos. And uh, then finally, I'll conclude with a bit of a look at the overall costs of going racing and kind of what I got out of it and whether I think that if you're considering it, you should. So I'm targeting this series at sim races because even though, as you'll see in my story, I was quite young when I was sim racing, I think sim racing can teach you so much about actually driving at the limit and car control. And actually, it's the natural progression from sim racing to track days and then ultimately actual racing. OK, so let's all jump in the DeLorean and go back in time. And let's start by actually looking at the first time I got in a go-kart. So in this picture, I'm about eight or nine. And I actually remember my dad having a bit of an argument with the guy running the place because I was too small to actually go in the adult carts. Uh, and then my dad had a go at him and he let me go out anyway. So I must admit, I don't remember being amazingly fast straight away. Uh, I think as a kid, uh, the speed's quite scary. And I just remember it shaking my hands a lot uh, and my hands going numb. We did go a few more times when I was that young. Uh, I didn't really get a lot faster. That was until I got this. Wow, look at that. I think that was called a Driving Force Pro. And this was my first force feedback wheel. And this probably started to change everything. So I think Gran Turismo was probably the first game that I got that I could actually use the wheel with. And um, yeah, I absolutely loved it. Constantly played that game all the time. Gran Turismo 4 came out, it had Nürburgring in it, so I learned that on that game as well. And yeah, basically I just noticed my skill level going up and up and up. The more I drived, the more I learned, and the better I got. It was around this time I also found this game called Live for Speed. The graphics on it were pretty atrocious, uh, but it's the first game that I knew that had like real realistic handling on it. The tires deformed, uh, the body rolled in a way that you'd expect the car's body to roll. The suspension was all kind of properly uh, mapped out and actually reacted more like a real car. Uh, and, and yeah, basically this game taught me so much in car control, understanding oversteer, understeer, how hard you can push a tyre, when you need to back off, etc. So as a result of this, when I actually went go kai again, I found that I was just a lot, lot faster. Uh, I could almost go to any track and walk home with uh, the first place prize or at least a podium. And um, yeah, a lot of time I'd turn up at a track the first time, actually be the top on the timing as well. And I remember I used to just get this thing where I always used to go to a track uh, and people would look at me almost sort of thinking, oh, he's got no chance. And then ended up standing at the top of the podium at the end. Um, and all I could really put it down to was sim racing or driving on a force feedback wheel. It was basically the only training I'd ever done. And it's when I started noticing I went quicker. So I ended up upgrading my wheel to a Logitech G25 that was even better for sim racing. And also around this time, actually got into real cars. And then cars obviously led on to track days.
So that 106 GTI served me really well. I did a whole range of track days in it all around the country. I only found a couple of clips which were just stuck on here. Uh, and then I got at the time my dream car. So for anybody who couldn't catch what that car was, it's a Honda S2000. And I modified it quite heavily and took it to a whole bunch of track days, just like the 106 GTI. It was a really uh, fun car to have, really, really revvy. Uh, and I found just a couple of clips of it on track here. So one of the reasons why I've included all this history of the track days, etc., is that if you are considering going motor racing, uh, I think it's definitely worth going go-karting first. Uh, and then once you've sort of done some go-karting, actually do some track days. Uh, I think the last thing you really want to do is go straight from sim racing straight into actual racing. It's better to get used to handling a car actually on track and getting used to the actual sense of speed when you're doing it for real. So... One thing I was finding with these track days was uh, I was getting told quite a lot uh, that I was driving too aggressively for track. And if I really wanted to drive that fast, I should really go racing instead, um, which I thought was stupid uh, since a track day is designed for driving fast. But it was around this time I saw this advert on uh, PlayStation for this thing called GT Academy. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, GT Academy is basically a partnership with Nissan and Sony where um, drivers compete in the game to qualify for a chance to compete for real to then win a real life racing contract. So I loaded the game up and started competing. Can't remember exactly what the format was. Uh, I think it was heats each week or so. The end final all came down to a top 20 for your region. So if you could get uh, your time within that top 20 uh, then you would have a chance to go to the live final. Um, obviously, you had millions of people taking part in this and everybody wanted to be in that top 20. So it was down to literally hundreds of a second per person over an entire lap. And yeah, I just kept doing laps after laps after laps after laps. In the end, I got in the top 20 uh, and then the next day you'd check and you'd been pushed out of the top 20. And then you do lots and lots of laps again. You get in the top 20 and next day you check, you'd be pushed out of the top 20. So uh, at one of the times when I was actually in the top 20, I saw this event posted, uh, I think I saw it on GT Planet or something like that. Uh, and there were wildcard events happening around the UK. This one was at the London Eye. And uh, yeah, basically if you went to the event and competed live, if you could set the fastest time that day, you basically got a live place in the final. Um, and your chance to win the entire GT Academy. So pop down there, a really cool event. Uh, they had a 370Z that was the same as the one in the game. 
lots of cool displays and stuff. They'd obviously spent quite a lot of money on just this one wildcard thing. And um, yeah, basically competed, uh, was doing really well. I think I turned up and set the fastest time almost immediately. Uh, and then a few more people turned up. There were a lot of people that were really rubbish, uh, just Joe Public off the street or people that weren't really that good at all. Uh, and then there were a handful of us that were really, really good. So there were a few guys in esports tops um, that worked for actual esports teams for full time. Uh, and a few other people like me that just practiced the game quite a lot and were just trying to win. Um, what ended up happening was I think it was about three of us uh, kept swapping the top spot. Um, and yeah, it was really, really coming down to uh, one of us would win this and we would be going to the final. And it, I think actually went over to the next day because it was so contended. Um, and once again, I, I think I turned up and just set the quickest time and then somebody else beat it. And then we kind of just kept knocking tenths or hundredths of a second off each other's laps. The real difficulty was you couldn't really get in the car and just do lap after lap. I think you've got three laps and then you had to get out and you had to let like say 50 people have a go and then you got in again. Um, so it made it hard to make a really, really good lap put together. Plus the sim rig was not what I was used to, uh, driver's excuses, etc. So unfortunately for me, but fortunately for this guy, James, uh, I basically didn't win. I came runner up. Uh, it was very close between us two. Literally, I had it in the bag and then within, I don't know, like 20 minutes before the whole event ended, he managed to just pit me. Uh, and beat me but fair play to the guy he seemed a nice enough guy and yeah I was still in the top 20 at this point so ultimately I thought I'd still get to the live event anyway just by staying at top 20 on the actual GT Academy time trial event so I got a nice email uh, basically congratulating me on my efforts and uh, awarding me some Nissan stuff and a wheel and stuff and ultimately, because I was still in the top 20 at this point, uh, I actually thought uh, I'd probably see him at the UK finals anyway. So uh, as you can see, here's James who beat me uh, standing next to Jan Mardenborough. Um, unfortunately for me, uh, with other commitments I had at the time um, and just how fierce the competition was, I actually got pushed out of the top 20 moments before the end of the competition. So... Uh, even though I was trying pretty hard, I think I finished something like 22nd or something, uh, which meant that I was a reserve driver that if somebody had dropped out of the live final, I would have gone in. Uh, but yeah, so I didn't didn't make it. Um, these guys did. Uh, so they went on TV, went through the whole uh, GT Academy process uh, and stuff, which looked really cool. And uh, Jan Mardenborough actually won it that year. I actually got a chance to meet Jan, I think it was a year later, uh, at another uh, Nissan uh, GT Academy event. And he was a smashing bloke, totally down to earth, really deserved to win it. Clearly had a lot of talent and how he's got on since winning GT Academy certainly proves that. He's gone on to uh, race for Nissan, win Le Mans, I think, and a whole range of other things. Absolutely smashing guy. And really, my takeaway was I probably wasn't that good enough anyway. So this left me uh, back to just normal track days and go-karting as I was before. Uh, iRacing wasn't really as much of a thing as it is now. I did actually load iRacing once, but um, it wouldn't run on my computer. So if you ever see my iRacing career, you'll see that for about 10 years or something like that, it didn't do anything at all. Uh, and then my eye rating started moving when I actually started doing it more recently. But yeah, I think it's ever since I was a kid and I watched a movie called Days of Thunder on VHS, uh, I've always wanted to be a racing driver, always wanted to go racing. So yeah, ultimately, I remember uh, chatting to my dad down a pub, I think at Christmas or something like that. And after all the GT Academy stuff, he said, look, just go racing. It's going to cost you a lot of money. But if you don't do it, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And so uh, we put the wheels in motion. I applied for a race license and the rest is all history. So I realise this video has been me waffling on about my uh, past and my history. And uh, this has probably been quite boring to anybody that actually wanted to know how to go racing. Uh, this is going to come in the next few videos. 
So the next video will be looking at finding a series to race in and how you go about doing that. And then once you've done that, how do you find a car or build a car that matches that series? And then how can you actually get that ready to race? Following that, obviously, we've got other videos coming up, such as um, actually then everything else you need to do. So race licenses, uh, all the equipment you need, all the paperwork, etc., etc. And I'll cover that. And then I'll actually start taking us through some of the races I did, talk about the formalities of that, how that all worked on the day, show some footage of me racing, uh, critique it because some of it will probably be a bit cringeworthy. And then uh, finally, we'll close off with something about costs because ultimately racing costs a lot of money and it's worth delving into exactly what it costs to actually do this. And finally, I'll conclude with kind of my thoughts over it all and whether you should go racing. So if you're still listening, well done for getting this far. Apologies for me waffling on too much. Uh, hopefully it was useful. Uh, if not, at least maybe you've learned a bit more about my back history uh, and why I do iRacing as much as I do now. As always, if you haven't, please like the video. And if you're new to this channel and you're not subscribed, please subscribe and I'll catch you all on the next one.